Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to start a new series now on the Creed. Uh, thanks for joining in on this, and um, we're excited to do this. So, uh, if you checked out our uh, live stream of the Mass this Sunday, one of my friends texted me and said, we're excited you're going to be doing the Creed. You couldn't even say it on Sunday. And it was true. I totally messed up the Creed. We're so used to being together, uh, it's sometimes hard to do that on your own. So, we'll see if I mess this up. It's quite possible. Uh, so today we're going to jump into the Nicene Creed, uh, and maybe just a little background on what, what is a creed. And we're going to jump into that first line today, but uh, the Nicene Creed is named for the Council of Nicaea. And that happened in the year 325. And what are the creeds? And there's a, there's a great illustration that St. Irenaeus uh, gives us about this. St. Irenaeus lived in the 2nd century, great early church father. And... One of the things he says is that the Bible, right, as Catholics, we sometimes get confused about the Bible. We don't feel like we know the Bible very well. I always feel like I should know it better than I do. The Bible is hard to know. There's so much in here. It's really confusing and complex. And it's hard to know how to read the Bible. And St. Irenaeus says that the Bible is a lot like a mosaic. If you know what a mosaic is, it's a piece of art and in the ancient world, what would happen is, if you uh, wanted a mosaic, sometimes the artist would uh, put thousands of pieces of stone or small pieces of glass, and they would come in a shipment. But when you got it, it's just this big box of stone and glass. And how do you know how you're supposed to arrange it? And so if you didn't know how to put that uh, different, all the different pieces together, it would be like a puzzle. You could come up with anything at all, really. And so Irenaeus says, you know, if you put those pieces together, the image you're going to come out with, he says, is like a snarling dog. Wouldn't be too attractive. But what artists would oftentimes do in the ancient world is when they shipped you that mosaic, they would put a key with it. And the key, it's like a little map for the mosaic, it would tell you where all the pieces went. And that way you knew how to assemble the mosaic, so it looks right. And Irenaeus says that when we do that, we get a beautiful picture of Christ the King. And so the, the Bible can be distorted in all kinds of ways. There goes my sheet. It can be distorted to kind of say anything you want. Because there's so much in here. For instance, in, in Matthew chapter 4, Satan quotes Scripture to Christ. And we all know that you can make Scripture say kind of anything you want it to say if you try hard enough. And so it's important for us to say, well, how do you put it together? What's our, what's our kind of uh, map? What's our, our key for putting together that mosaic? And the early church said it's what's called the symbol of faith. And what that developed into is what we know as, as the creeds. So probably the most important creed we have as Christians, and not just Catholics use this, but most churches use the Nicene Creed, which we say on Sundays, most churches use the Nicene Creed as a key for understanding what this all says. It simplifies the faith. It says, here's, here's what it's about. Here's the main story of what our faith is. And if anyone contradicted it, we knew they were off. Uh, the Creed also was a way of refuting heresies. So, for instance, uh, one of the big heresies that the Creed refutes is Arianism. And so Arius was an early priest and he started a heresy, and he didn't believe Jesus was fully God. He thought he was something more than man, but less than a God. And he used scripture to prove his point. So he would quote, for instance, Mark chapter 13, where Jesus says he doesn't know when the end of the world is going to come. And Arius says, how can he be God? How could Jesus be God if he says, I don't know when the end of the world is? So we have to be careful about just scripture alone. And the creeds helped the church to say this is what Christianity is about. Okay, so the Nicene Creed, it started at the Council of Nicaea, 325. It's also going to be completed uh, in the year 381 with the Council of Constantinople. So the full title of that creed is really the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, but that's kind of too much to say. So we just say Nicene Creed. 
Okay, so why does this matter? And I just want to dive in. This is going to be a great moment for us to think about things we say all the time. You know, we say things so flippantly sometimes that we don't think about what we're saying. And I'm guilty of that too. So just some introductory thoughts today as we begin our reflections. Creed, so that's a Latin word. And so credo in Latin means I believe. And today we want to dive into that. What, is, what does it mean to say I believe? We used to have, before the translation of the Mass changed, we used to say back in about, uh, right before 2011, we would say we believe. And the Latin says credo, I believe. And so how, how can we change those? Well, there's a certain sense in that I is really the church speaking. And so we used to say we as an individual sense. But that I that's speaking is not just you. It's not your individual faith. It's the faith of the church. It's the church speaking. And we say, I believe it's the voice of Mother Church. Well, what does it mean to believe? And I want to start there with our reflections. Uh, what does it mean to believe something? And I just want to eliminate some common misunderstandings. Uh, so C.S. Lewis talks about how he used to be confused about, before he became a Christian, he says, I found it odd that Christians would talk about growing in faith. Either something's true or it's not. I either think uh, three and three is six or I don't. But how can I grow in my uh, belief, so to speak, that three and three is six? Uh, and so C.S. Lewis didn't understand faith. And what I want to get at today is that faith is not just thinking something's true. It's, it's at least that, but it's much, much more. Faith, the catechism, is going to tell us that, and it, it, really at the very beginning of the catechism, there's an intro to the catechism, and then really the very first paragraph that's not part of just the introduction, it defines faith as a surrender. Right? Uh, everything begins with God. It's not that I came up with something, it's that when Christ breaks into our life, there's something of a surrender that has to happen. It's not just that I think something's true, it's that the deepest part of who I am, right, the deepest part of who I am is engaged. One great image of faith in this surrender is that first name of Christianity. Uh, the first name for Christianity was the way. And what it means is that when Jesus encountered Peter or Andrew or James or John, he didn't hand them a checklist and say, do you believe this, 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 and this? But rather, there was something in Christ that was so powerful. There was something beautiful in him and engaging. And he said to those first apostles, come follow me. Right, like in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus is in Peter's boat, which is a great image for the church. It's Peter's boat. Jesus performs a great sign where he um, catches a great catch of fish. And he says to Peter, right, come follow me. And Peter didn't know everything about Jesus. He didn't probably know at that moment that he was truly God. He didn't understand that he was perfectly united to the Father. But there was something there that made Peter say, I can, I'm going to follow. I'm going to leave behind my boat, and I'm going to go follow this man from Nazareth. Uh, and that's really important for us. Faith is not simply a, yes, I believe, or no, I don't. Faith is a wrestling. St. Paul wrestles with his faith all over the New Testament. Pope Benedict, in a great book called The uh, Introduction to Christianity, which is, again, it's really not an introduction, it's it's a difficult book. But Pope Benedict talks about how faith for us in our whole life means a wrestling with God. It means taking a chance. It means getting out of the boat and following after Christ. And that's why we can grow in faith. To answer C.S. Lewis's question, faith is not just an intellectual thing. It is that, but it's much more. Faith is God doesn't just want me to say, you know what, Brian, I'm God, believe in me. He wants me to take a chance. He wants me to surrender something of myself and say, wow, like I have to risk something here. 
I have to, I have to get out of my comfortable place. I have to leave behind my security and I have to go follow him. And so faith has something profoundly to do with that risk. And so as we be begin our, the treatment of the creed, to believe means something like that. You can't be a Christian and just be comfortable on the couch. God always calls us onto the way. He calls us to follow him, to take a step. And when we've done that, I wish he would just say, hey, Brian, you know, you did that. That's great. You have faith. But what he always does is he says, okay, take the next step. And the next step. And so faith becomes this surrendering of my life to God. And finally, I just want to leave it with this. The, the Latin word for, for faith is creed. It's credo, I believe. In Greek, it's pistis. And pistis it means faith, but it also means faithfulness. And so the New Testament tells us all over the place that Jesus had faith. Uh, and it doesn't mean we get into some deeper... Uh, kind of ways of how St. Thomas Aquinas talks about that. But I, I want to talk about the way the Bible understands that. When the Bible says Jesus had faith, what it really means is his faithfulness. Jesus was faithful. And uh, in Romans, for instance, in Romans 1.17, Paul says that the gospel is from faith for faith. And what he means by that is, is very simple. It sounds like a lot, but it's very simple. It means that because Jesus is faithful... I can be faithful. Right? When um, when you're a little kid and you go to the pool and you're scared to jump off that diving board because you can't swim yet, and your dad is is sitting there and saying, okay, come on, come on in. Right? The, the reason the child can jump into the, the deep waters of that pool is because that, that kid knows that her dad is faithful. She's like, my dad's always there. Whenever I, you know, fall over, my dad's there to pick me up. And he's, he's going to be there to make sure I'm safe. And he's going to teach me how to ride a bike and do all these things. And when your dad's faithful or your mom is faithful, and you know that, it enables you to take a chance to be faithful. That's what faith is about. And Jesus is perfectly faithful to the Father in the New Testament. And he's perfectly faithful to us, always, right? Far more than any human being. And so we know that because God is faithful, because he was first faithful, that means that I can take a chance and I can risk faith. Faith is always a risk. Okay, so we begin and we say, I believe. I have faith. I surrender myself. I don't understand everything perfectly. But I am going to walk out on the way. I'm going to leave behind my life of security and pleasure and comfort uh, and in my own self kind of reliance. And I'm going to set out to follow Christ. I believe. I believe in one God. And, and this is really where we're going to uh, see a profound just echo of the Old Testament here. So the Church in Her Wisdom gives us this line, I believe in one God. And the first thing I want you, brothers and sisters, to see with this is that that's an echo of Israel's faith. And so, for any Jew, maybe the most important uh, line in Scripture is Deuteronomy 6.4. And so, in Deuteronomy 6.4, we have what's called the Shema. And we know in Jesus' time that devout Jews would say the Shema twice a day. They'd say it in the mornings and in the evenings. And so in Deuteronomy 6.4, uh, God says, Hear, as it Shema is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with your, all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might or strength. But the Shema begins with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Right? One God. And we begin the creed, we say, I believe in one God. Now, the great contention that Jesus brings with uh, his fulfillment of the Old Testament faith of the Jews 
is that the Jews give us that gift of monotheism. They're the ones who show the world there's, there is only one God. And But with Christians and with what Jesus reveals to us is that that unity, that oneness of God is not a static unity. Right? God is not just kind of that um, old man with a beard who's kind of bored and he had to create the world because he had no one to talk to and he needed something to do. That's not who God is. God's uh, oneness, his unity, is a dynamic unity. And so we're going to say in the Creed, we're going to have three sections to the Creed. We're going to have this first brief section on God the Father Almighty. Uh, but then we're going to jump to, and I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. Right? And then I believe in the Holy Spirit. And so there's this dynamic nature to the one God. And so the Creed really is meant to evoke in us that this unity, this oneness in God, has a little bit of an asterisk to it. It has that asterisk where there is only one God, but the one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now I want to uh, jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And St. Paul has a great play, uh, way here where he takes the Shema and he brings out this dynamism that's revealed in Christ. So, in 1 Corinthians 8, uh, and we're going to look at verse 5, and turn to your Bibles there if you have them. So, 1 Corinthians 8, 5, St. Paul's talking about the Shema here. He says, For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, he's talking about pagan idols here, not any real existence. Uh, although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God. Right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things. Right? God creates all things. We're getting that to the next video about how all things are from God the Father. And for whom we exist. But then Paul breaks the Shema. He basically breaks it in half. And he's just going to break it open. So, the Lord our God is one. Right? There's one God, one Lord. And so Paul's going to apply the term God to the Father and the term Lord to Jesus. Yet there is for us one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. So there's this dynamic parallel in 1 Corinthians 8 between the Father and the Son. And Paul gets this right because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I want to dive in here, and I just want to dwell on this unity for a minute. God, heaven is not boring, and God is not bored. God has this dynamic, perfect communion from all eternity. And the Creed wants us to see this. And I want to jump here to, uh, really to John's Gospel. We're going to look at chapter 17. Jesus, throughout John's Gospel, he's going to talk about how there's a dynamic unity between him and the Father. So, for instance, in John 10, Jesus will say, I and the Father are one. I am one. And isn't that beautiful? The unity that we're called to as Catholics is not this static unity. God is not this boring, just kind of, yeah, static unity. He's dynamic. He has perfect love within the Trinity. This perfect indwelling. We'll get to that in a second. So in John 17, though, is where Jesus is in the high priestly prayer. And Jesus is going to talk about, he's going to pray that the church may be one. And he's going to do that four times. Four times. And so this is hugely important. Uh, God's unity, and this is what I'm trying to drive at today, is that God's unity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is what gives unity to us as Christians. Uh, and isn't that all you want? That's all I want out of life. 
I don't want a unity where I lose myself, right? That's kind of Buddhism and Hinduism kind of have a tendency that way, where there's almost like this dissolving into the oneness of reality. Christianity doesn't believe in that. Christianity believes in communion. That the Father and the Son, even though they're one, they're also distinct. But there, there is a perfect union in nature and the dynamic love they have for each other. So, in John 17, Jesus is going to pray that the church becomes one. And this is a huge challenge for us today. A lot of people today think it doesn't matter what kind of Christian you are. It doesn't matter. It's just like it's Baskin Robbins. It's 31 flavors. It's all just ice cream. And as long as you, you know, just pick whichever one you like, that's all that matters. It's not true. It's not true. Four times in John 17, Jesus prays that you and I would be united. It's all over the New Testament. It's not just John 17. Uh, Philippians, for instance, is all about this. Ephesians chapter 2 has seven unities. It's all over the New Testament. So, Jesus prays it. He's about to go to the cross and he says, he's praying to the Father. He says, Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. It says verse 11, that they may be one even as you and I are one, right? Jesus in, in John 15 and 14, he's going to say, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. There's this, the, the church fathers call this perichoresis. There's your Greek word for the day. Perichoresis means a mutual indwelling. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And I don't know about you, but I think I do. Is that there's been people in my life that I've loved so much that I, I just want to be in their hearts the way that the Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father. Right? There's, love calls us to dwell in others. And the reason we're that way is because God made us that way. It's because the Trinity operates on that level. One more verse I just want to highlight in 17, John 17, uh, is in verse uh, 20 and 21. So Jesus says, I do not pray for these only, not just the, uh, the early Christian community and the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Right? The, the, Jesus desires for us to be one in him, and he to be one in us. And because of our love for Christ, then, right, we have this dynamic unity together. Uh, so, the church, as we begin the creed, right, we're called to this faith, to this surrender. It's not a one-and-done type of thing. It's the kind of moment where you and I are able to surrender our hearts and our minds and our lives and to surrender into that unity that belongs to God. Uh, so, today, as uh, we kind of go through our first meditation on the creed, I invite you, brothers and sisters, to think about that unity that God has uh, to lose yourself in it, uh, and then finally, uh, that we would all move towards that as Christians. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, God bless you all, and we will see you all next time.